Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today to, um, to sit down with our group and our panel today to discuss aviation finance and the ESG agenda. This really is key to um, the aviation world. And our panel today will discuss this topic and run through with you. We have Kieran O'Brien, who is a partner in management consulting and is the lead advisory partner in the aviation finance practice at KPMG. We have Declan Kelly, who's the chair of Aircraft Leasing Ireland which is the world's largest aircraft lesser trade organization. And we have Jan Mallard, from executive, who is the executive chairman of um, FPT Momentum, um, one of the world's um, leading lessors. So welcome to everyone today, and thank you for joining us. Um, so to kick us off, we're, Kieran is going to give us um, uh, an overview of this, of this area and to run through the challenges, some of the aviation challenges the aviation sector is facing at the moment. So Kieran, over to you. Thanks very much, Laura. And I would point out one type of why we very much like Laura to be a partner in KPMG. She's a partner in Arthur Cox. And so to give her, to give her credit. And um, so we might just bring up the slides if that's okay. Great, thank you. So I won't be too long, but just to give, to give a sense of this, right? So Clearly, everyone will be aware that, that ESG and those factors are hugely important. They're becoming more important to corporates, to creditors, to stakeholders. Ultimately, it's becoming a key component in investment decisions. And we're seeing it more and more in an aviation context, be it private equity or banks, that these questions are coming up. And while there's no universal criteria for ESG, clearly there's becoming a more, I guess, a best practice is evolving. And I think it's, you know, really it's outstanding that, that it's it's gaining the, the support of the wider aviation group and that ALI have established a working group to develop ESG, which I think is hugely important, I think, going forward. This will all be about transparency and about ultimately collaborating and working together to get to reach our targets. And maybe just where are we today? So aviation is one of the defined six harder to abate sectors, you know, and they have common characteristics, be it a long asset lifespan, high energy dependency, difficult to electrify, and no clear technology roadmap, but they include, you know, road, freight, iron, steel, cement, chemicals, and aviation runs at about 3% of that in, in terms of CO2 emissions, but, but that's a hugely significant number, and it's something that the overall community is clearly very focused on. Okay, I think as we break that down, when we start to think about it, you know, and, and this slide talks about kind of short haul, medium and long haul. Short haul is probably ultimately an equivalent to, to regional. You'll see that there's a fairly, you know, reasonable split, 1944, 37% in terms of CO2. And some of the answers to these areas will probably be different. Um, and I think this just shows that, you know, this is a well spread uh, challenge across the, the, the whole of the aviation sector. Uh, and that's ultimately what we're saying, but that there's work to be done in that. I think then, this is probably just an interesting slide that, that IBA produced in terms of CO2 numbers. And clearly you can see a fairly big dip right, in, in line with the pandemic, right, which ultimately referenced you know, people not flying. The reality is that, that that's not the answer we all want. We want a world where we have a global economy, we have socially globalised. And, and we're able to travel and, and to do that well, but it can't be at the wrong cost. And I think ultimately this just demonstrates that, you know, how much effort is required. We need to be able to get to a position where we reduce CO2, but, you know, we don't want to be reducing flights. And ultimately, why is that? Because if we look at where we are today, you'll clearly see that the larger, more developed countries and areas or regions in the world are the ones that are driving CO2, as you'd expect. But the reality is aviation volume is expected to more than double by 2050. So therefore, that clearly means that we have work to do as that grows. We really need to, to be focused as an economy around that. And we see more and more investors looking at ESG to understand what are groups doing, what are they asking, be it airlines, be it less hours, be it airports. It's all around that and, uh, and driving that forward. But this really just shows that, you know, what, that as we get developing economies further into aviation, we've lots of work to do before as, the, as I guess the challenge gets larger. This really is just an example of a decarbonisation pathway. I think this is really important. It, it really defines a number of things. First and foremost, that the answer is a blended answer. 
it isn't one thing or something else. It's it's lots of things, and it's working together, I guess, to achieve all of those things. It could be technology, it could be efficiency gains, it could be you know uh, operation improvement, infrastructure improvements. Clearly, uh, sustainable fuel, aviation fuel has a, a key role to play, be that bio or synthetic. Um, and as we see on the next slide, that there's lots of work to be done there. But we'd also see what's come out recently at the EU in terms of regulations around this. So it is, it is going to play a significant part of that. The, the next slide then, it, it just really talk about decarbonisation barriers. And really the, the fundamental part of this is that we ultimately see lots of items here. And it's all around understanding those and seeing it. Clearly cost is a factor here. Aviation hasn't always been a, a, a very high margin business, um, but investment is required to fix this problem. On top of that, we need to understand that ultimately, you know, travellers have seen this a little bit as a commodity concept. And so there's that balance between ensuring value for our customers, yet doing the right thing via sustainability. And that's a key driver. Regular issues are there. I think we've talked about technology. You know, we talked at the start about there isn't necessarily a key technology roadmap for solving this. There's lots of things and lots of investment being made and R&D being made, but that needs further. But I think you'll see from the survey that that's not actually seen as a major barrier. It's seen more of a minor barrier. So there is a bit to do in terms of that, but lots of work to do and, and lots of groups working on it, which I think is a positive. How fast can it change? Um, I think acid replacement is a challenge, right? But but it's it's probably you know it's something that can be managed and we've seen lots of airlines and, and lots of lesser has been really effective at, at moving you know through assets and managing that life cycle really well and I think it's something the sector can certainly support uh, in terms of doing that. Maybe just in, in terms of a, of, a, of a summary sorry what are we saying we're, we're saying there's clearly barriers but there's lots of work going on across lots of things be it regulation technology fuel etc to do that but there's lots of barriers to or lots of benefits as well apologies it's really around understanding stakeholders and, and driving it esg is becoming more and more important to all aviation companies which is really important and it's becoming a more valid part in terms of financing and ultimately operating successfully as a business and laura might hand back to you now if that's okay and thank you for clearing that up um i am a one of the aviation partners in Arthur Cox. Um, um, so th that was really interesting, Kieran. And just just one thing, there is a lot of talk in the industry with regards to the E in the ESG, but how can we increase the focus on the S and G and build sustainable outcomes? Um, I don't know, Declan, can you can you give us your thoughts on how like social and governance can be fostered more in the leasing industry and you know what the um, what you're what the what you're seeing the lessers doing to help you know build this out just beyond the environmental focus so um thank you laura and i think kieran framed it up very well so you know i think if, when you look at aviation we look at it as the lessor group um we're looking at it what we call cradle to grave and it's the aircraft life cycle on average these assets are in sort of the operating sphere for on average about 20 25 years typically around 20. so when we look at it um you know it's it's a highly regulated um industry and something which is really struggling with um <clears throat> how you bring esg to, to to the table and and how we how we develop it so you know we've looked at this probably for the last um, 12 months now and um we've we've developed two clear themes one is the management of the asset and it's how it's how you actually you know manage that aircraft from the day you buy it until the day it, it's parked out in, in whoever own, owns it and the other is the operational side which Kieran touched on so when we sit back and we look at um, how aircraft are, are managed it's a highly regulated paper intense environment and uh, we need to transition quickly from the analog systems and the analog sense of management that we have today to digital and you know it's interesting when we you know as COVID um, you know unfortunately became, became part of all, all our worlds, it really was a catalyst for change with the regulatory authorities. Where when we look at, at the transition of assets from you know as a sale of, of an aircraft, it can be done electronically. The transition of an aircraft um, from an operator to an operator, 
is very manual intensive and very paper intensive. And because of COVID, we actually got the aviation authorities to accept electronic signatures. Now we, we need to do more to keep developing that. And the electronic signatures really was driven, which really were helpful to us, was driven by the Irish Aviation Authority and by EASA, who's the largest regulatory authority, their European side, would be the FAA on the, on the American side. So, but when, when we look, when we sit back and look at just the basic management of it, we as the lessor community, and including the financiers and, and investors, we have to leverage our influence. But we really need to bring the entire ecosystem on board, be it manufacturers, you know, the Boeing, the Airbuses, the, the MROs, the maintenance repair organizations, the airlines. And we all have to have a common goal here. And that's what we're, we're slowly striving at. So we at ALI have launched a digitized maintenance registry program. And have, have, we've run piloted programs with Aer Lingus and with Dublin Airspace. But we need to we need to do a lot more and we need to have this system um, built. And you, the reason you need a registry is, you know, you obviously, you know, it has to be we want to build something that will go out to the next century. And equally, you can transition assets quickly via just transferring sort of cloud based data from one system to another system and, and has to happen seamlessly. So we, we're really looking into that extensively and we're looking to to base that in Ireland. So that's sort of one piece of this. And that's just basically, you know, the, the, the sort of what I would argue, the, or what I would call the financial management of, of the aircraft and, and, and its technical records. But the other piece is we really need to limit the carbon footprint, footprint of needless waste in, in aircraft transitions where, you know, we're, we're, we, if we transition an aircraft from, from an FAA operator, let's say, to a European operator, while both of those aircraft can legally operate in and out of each other's countries, they cannot be based there. So we're spending a huge amount of time and waste of, of changing software and hardware on these aircraft just to meet standards. So we really need to focus on that. We also, you know, and as we help and develop this equally when we transitioned aircraft, you know, from, you know, let's say from um, American Airlines to uh, British Airways, you know, people have their own branding in, in aircraft cabins, which is fine. But equally, there's other waste that's going on behind the scenes. So we have to really, we have to really, you know, really uh, drill down into this and, and focus on it. But the upside for us when we do this will be, you know, traceability on our, on our aircraft components will improve. We will add to the circular economy and, you know, aviation today will, contri will, it will contribute to less, to more reusing of, of aircraft parts and, and components and, and striving with just with less waste. And I think that's, that's a key piece which we need to do and, and will focus on. Now, moving on to the operations piece of it, we have formed a sustainability task force and committee and we need to, to really leverage our influence. We have to be part of the solution. And today we are involved in EU taxonomy discussions. Uh, and I think, you know, from our sense of this is by being part of the conversation, it really helps to, first of all, get awareness up, but also to get people more and more involved. And by that, we need to be one voice and be the consistent and be consistent as the voice up for everybody, for the, for the lessors, the financiers and the investors. Today, we're extremely fragmented. And the danger I see in a lot of this is we, we also will come with, with uh, very fragmented solutions. So we have to get together as a group and just all the owner of, of the owners of assets. And uh, we need to work the narrative and engage with all the stakeholders, the OEMs, suppliers, regulators, MROs, and come up with a, a quite a simple, credible, and give a transparent picture of aviation's pathway and metric as we develop sustainability. We need to establish a charter uh, for ALI for all members and indeed, and we welcome members. And by the charter, we basically have a code that we will adhere to and will develop and improve sustainability. And in closing, uh, and uh, my colleagues will talk about it, Jan will talk about this later on, but, but in closing, you know, really for us, we cannot wait for electric or hydrogen powered aircraft to act. It, it's going to be too late. That is out to the future. You will see some of that happening on some of the lighter model aircraft, which is fine. But for large commercial airplanes, it's it, it's 10, 15 years away. So that's so we need to act now. And by doing that, we really need to look for alternative fuel supply. And we should have Ireland be taking a lead in, in that uh, lead position in whatever we agree as that alternative fuel supply. Because if we have the resources and we have the and and we have the finance for Ireland to take a lead position.
Declan, that, that's really interesting and really good points on what Ireland can be doing more to, to foster this. And I suppose one of the elements would be to actually hold people to account and reporting and how to actually monitor compliance to actually meet the objectives. And, and Kieran, what can we do in terms of reporting? Like, is the industry doing enough? And, you know, what more c could the industry be doing to, you know, hold the various areas to account and to, um, to build on this? Thanks, Laura. I, 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 look, I think that's a fairly complex question, right? but it's the right question to be asking, if that makes sense. Um, ESG, I suppose, is getting more interesting, right? And, and if I think about what my, my colleagues in our Sustainable Futures team and KPG are looking at, um, not just in aviation, right, but, but across other sectors as well, is ultimately we see certainly a start in terms of the reporting, and that's ultimately people articulating, you know, uh, their view of what they're doing in terms of internally, be it considering ESG as a risk, being considering from a governance perspective, you know, performing the sustainability committee, having senior management members on it, ensuring that they can articulate that ESG topics are part of the business, that they're considered in strategic decisions, that there's clearly KPIs in place, and that there's you know, they're being mindful of, of, of different ESG regulations across all their operating entities, right? So and it's really around articulating that. I suppose as we see that move on, right, and we're seeing it a little bit now in aviation, is it's it's that key component around climate change and CO2 emissions, right? Is it thinking around, you know, do we have baselining for CO2 emissions so that we can understand the movement that's been made, not been made? Um, Declan mentioned the EU taxonomy, but that's usually important. I, one of the challenges around reporting in any form, if I could, but, but clearly is coming now, is, is around consistency. Um, it's hugely important that as a sector in aviation that we start to find a balance. Uh, and I think if I, you know, what, what Declan talked about a charter and that type of thing, this is exactly the type of thing that we need in terms of driving a level of consistency and standardization it's really important from the investor community perspective from from a stakeholder perspective that we are comparing apples with apples and oranges with oranges and that ultimately that level of consistency and transparency is across that reporting piece i think at the minute you have lots of of aviation businesses doing really excellent work in terms of putting forward uh, really strong esg reporting but really what we need to make sure is that there's a, a standard that is put forward by everybody and bring that to the fore. Ultimately, you know, Ireland has the capability, you know, it, it is a world leader in the aviation sector. And I think we have absolutely the opportunity to be, you know, the leader in ESG for the sector. I think the work that ALI are doing is usually important around that. And I think within ESG, it'll very much be around ensuring that we have really strong reporting that's really deep, that gets to the bottom of, you know, what are companies doing? Is this part of their business? Is it part of their business decisions, their KPIs, their management, what horizon scanning are they doing around that? And are we consistently seeing that reported across all those entities? And, and that, that's probably the biggest piece, I would say, Laura. It's about bringing consistency and transparency to it, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely total sense, Kieran, in terms of, you know, the standards that need to be met and, you know, consistency with the industry. And Jan, what do you think in terms of the lessors? What more could the lessors be doing? We see the banks providing finance, the airlines making investment into newer technology, you know, being fuel conscious. What can the lessors do to, you know, foster this in the in the leasing community? Well, I mean, Declan has touched upon a, a few things already, and uh, Declan also mentioned the SAF opportunity, and I think that's a, a key component in all of this. I mean, if we take a step back, I mean, clearly the fact to get uh, aviation to net zero by 2050, that in itself is going to be a huge challenge, no doubt about that. At the same time, it also represents a very significant opportunity, and given Ireland's place as a world leader in the aviation sector, it would be quite natural to look at what is the biggest and most important component in taking us to carbon neutrality, and that is uh, effectively the sustainable aviation fuels. 
Kieran showed a chart where we had both the biofuels and the synthetic fuels. Uh, clearly, the synthetic fuels are going to be the biggest contributor to the solution at the end of the day. It's also the part which will come later than the biofuels, but it doesn't change the fact that the biggest component to take us to carbon neutrality is uh, sustainable aviation fuels. Given Ireland's role in uh, green energy, and, I'm, and here I'm thinking, for example, on the windmill industry and the involvement in the windmill development, it would be quite natural for a country like Ireland to take a very active role to manufacturing sustainable aviation fuels. Uh, that is something which is lending itself to countries which are nimble, where you can piece together the various uh, stakeholders. And again, think of Ireland, we have world-class airlines here. We have the manufacturing uh, capability. We have the know-how from the windmill industry. And it so happens that the green electricity is a major component, in especially the synthetic fuels. So all in all, Ireland has a lot going for it when it comes to sustainable aviation fuels. So effectively for Ireland as a country to expand its value chain when it comes to aviation, because that's really what we are discussing, that is to effectively step into the sustainable aviation fuel space, that would be a very natural and, uh, as far as we are concerned, a very desirable step to take. And how could the Lasores contribute to that? Well, that's a discussion to be had, but one of the key components uh, for the sustainable aviation fuel would, of course, be financing. And you could imagine that there would be certain resources who would take that step and effectively join Ireland in expanding the value chain. So all in all, uh, the sustainable aviation fuel space is something which Ireland uh, has a keen interest in uh, taking part in, so to speak. It is to be seen as something which would deliver long-term value, both in terms of uh, high value jobs for the next 30 years. It would also deliver some very important intellectual property to the country, which could be uh, effectively capitalized later on and exported as well. It would also mean that the country would do away with some of the dependence on fossil fuel imports. Uh, and. All in all, there's just a number of good reasons why Ireland should take an active role in this. And uh, it so happens that right now there is some white space when it comes to uh, manufacturing sustainable aviation fuels, but it's not going to stay like this. Last week I was in uh, Glasgow, uh, an event arranged by Boeing, and one thing which is striking is that a country and like United Kingdom is moving fairly aggressively when it comes to something like this sustainable aviation fuel manufacturing. So for a country like Ireland, now is a good time to get going with this. There is a lot of good things going for Ireland and it's a great opportunity. So clearly this is one of the opportunities which are rising out of this uh, transition to carbon neutrality. And Jan, one of the focuses at the moment we've heard is for the replacement of old, less efficient aircraft with more efficient aircraft, um, really without contribution to fleet expansion. Um, what, will, what do you expect will be the impact for lessors that have a lot of older generation aircraft and, you know, what can they do in this space to to kind of like assist or kind of deal with this in terms of, you know, having a more, you know, I suppose fuel efficient fleet would be one one aspect. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you are spot on. I mean, we are already today seeing the movement towards uh, the new and uh, more fuel efficient and uh, uh, more energy efficient aircraft. So, so that movement is taking place as we speak. And what we are seeing already today as well is that you see a number of, uh, let's call it, uh, less efficient aircraft, which are effectively being left behind. We will see how this develops during the coming few years, but there is no doubt that uh, the movement of capital will increasingly be going towards the very energy efficient aircraft. And there is no doubt that the EU taxonomy, when that comes out, will effectively uh, speed up that process. So all in all, I, I think it's fair to say that the Lesor community is already now supporting the, the transition towards the most fuel efficient aircraft. And right now it's more a question of getting as many of the uh, most efficient aircraft into the global fleet and effectively leaving the less efficient aircraft behind.
Okay, no, thank you. Uh, and Declan, just jumping back to what you were saying earlier with regards a, a, a charter and just kind of like, you know, trying to get everybody to be consistent and a level playing field. What is Aircraft Leasing Ireland doing to help and design and create a framework or, you know, what actions are being taken on your side? So, <clears throat> Laura, so where we are, um, so we've established um through our council members, our sustainability you know, program, if you will, task, task force and um, and committee. So just to give people background, um, in Ireland at the moment, there's give or take between 175 to 200 billion dollars of aviation assets. Um, there are 50 lessors. We have 32 of those lessors are members of ALI. And of that, the seven of the top 10 are, are members. So there is a large influencing view and of our group, so give or take, um, it, the leasing world has owns about 50% of all commercial aircraft, somewhere between 45 to 50. Um, the uh, ALI's members control about 60% of those. So large influence um, where we're coming from. But I think ultimately is, um, and this is what I said, I, you need to have the entire ecosystem come on board with what we're doing be it the, you know, from the OEMs right through to the MROs as a part of. But for, for us, I think um, the lessors, we have to align ourselves with, as ALI, we need to align ourselves with equally with non-members where others can, can influence, i.e. the, you know, the, the big banks, the financiers. And we're also seeing a lot of um, new funding coming in from be, be it private equity or, or in from uh, separate investment funds. So we need to sort of, you know, open open um, our, our, our offerings to people and bring more influencers in. And I think when you do that, I think there is a very valuable um, acceptance that, you know, the world is changing, it's changing fast. If there only were electric aircraft today, guess what? We would finance 100% of them, but they're not there. So th that that's the issue. You, you need to have transparency and you need to have a metric. And I think Kieran touched on it as well. You know, you have to have a baseline, but equally, we're not going to wait around for, um, you know, you know to, to reinvent the wheel again. The baseline can be established quite quickly. You know, one, one thing you learn about aviation, um, the operation of it it's so data intensive it's, it's ironic it's so data intensive but yet it's it's analog managed which is which, which is like the two don't work but i think where we're coming from is we have our you know we have the, the largest trading um trade network in, in the world on managing aircraft we are getting a significant um voice at, uh, at seat at the table and i think you will see from us as we develop but equally you know, when we started ALI, it was it was initially you know to maintain our, our Ireland's presence in the our global presence in in the world of aviation, um, and also but to be one voice to government. And I think we learned a lot from that, and we learned interactions with government and and how and how how you can affect change. So I think ultimately that's where we're going to come from with with, with our charter. We know how to do this. Um, we have the membership and the and we, you know which is more important the balance sheets behind them the, these these um, less our platform there are, are, are tremendous and equally as we bring in the west the rest of the world the banking community the private equity community and the uh, investor the individual investor fund managers i think that's where this really comes together and i think that's where we'll be coming from but you know we're not going to you know we need to uh, develop this we've given ourselves up to i think january we're going to come out with our, our charter and then you know we will be linking that directly to performance and great thank you and kieran just jumping back kieran. to you in terms of um your slide on you know 20 2050 um, that we need a mix of technology, SAF, and offsets to reach net zero. Is that possible, do you think, by that time frame? Or um, I, I may be answer different, way, Laura. I think we need to make it possible, if that makes sense. I, I think ultimately, look, this is a, a huge challenge, not just for aviation, like, but for 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 every sector. Um, and I don't think we should be saying, you know, that. 
Um, it's too big of a challenge. We shouldn't be doing it. Uh, I think the reality is we're now in in, in twenty one. You know, the, the target is for twenty fifty. Right, it's a long, it's a long way away. But I, I think it is around. You know, working together. And I think to be fair, both Declan and Jan have touched on a number of major topics. There, one is around, you know, the industry as a whole coming together behind this, not just the industry, government, uh, and everyone else, right, working together. Like, like Jan is absolutely correct in identifying sustainable fuels as a as a really good opportunity for for Ireland and for the sector. It's hugely important, and um, I, I think we've clearly seen there's lots of investment and drive. In new tech, which will you know clearly take a while to get there, and um, there's lots of effort into you know operational efficiency and those pieces having their impact right, and those numbers are there; they're not insignificant. And I think look, we've clearly seen lots and lots of airlines, lessors, and others looking at airports actually looking at that in real meaningful ways and trying to make a difference. So it's usually challenging. There's no question. But ultimately, I, I think that's what we need to realise is that it is usually challenging and therefore we need to make every effort collectively uh, to drive out those things to hopefully make the target or certainly get as far as long as we can and um, as soon as we can, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, definitely. And it, it, it does sound like a challenging um, deadline, but um, as you say, we, we do have to make it. And Jan, in, in terms of like, there is a lot of money coming into the aviation sector at the moment and is it the same for green finance like when you see in terms of like you know traditional lending or PE or you know capital market space what are you seeing is it is it a big focus of lenders coming into the space and are there incentives for lessors and you know yeah. you know en enhancements in terms of facilities um, coming from the, the finance market uh, the short answer is definitely. <clears throat> I mean, what we see going on right now is that uh, especially capital markets are being very active when it comes to financing aircraft in, in various capacities. We see the ADSs, we see the CLOs. So all in all, you can say that uh, COVID-19, if anything, has just uh, moved the market increasingly towards capital markets. That doesn't mean that the Conventional lenders are not there and will not be there tomorrow, but capital markets are taking more and more of a role. And there's no doubt that the investors uh, in capital markets are increasingly focused on the entire ESG dimension and will continue to be so. I mean, there is no doubt that once we have the EU taxonomy and we effectively have a framework for green investing, then uh, we will see even more focus on this. So you go fast forward a few years and the focus on ESG will just be growing and growing from the investor's perspective. That's, of course, uh, something which has to be met by the source. Uh, but I also think that it's fair to say that this could represent a significant opportunity for Ireland as well. Uh, Ireland has, uh, historically speaking, always proven to uh, be very nimble and innovative, uh, also in the fund management business, for example. Ireland, of course, has a keen interest in aviation and there is no legacy energy industry in Ireland. So there's a keen interest for Ireland to be a very proactive player when it comes to ESG. And one thing which would be advantageous for investors was, of course, to have an exchange which was dedicated to ESG compliant securities. That's something which we don't really have today and we don't see it today. On the other hand, you can say everything surrounding capital markets are very US centered. So again, uh, this is an opportunity for Ireland to effectively take on uh, an opportunity which is arising as a result of this transition towards carbon neutrality. What we are seeing is that uh, Ireland could establish a trading platform for ESG related securities. And of course, aviation would be a very good candidate for being one of the first categories. In that respect, you can say that aviation is a fairly a simple industry to deal with from a securities perspective. Um, it would effectively create a center of excellence in Ireland and a sphere of influence in the, in the global standard setting when it comes to ESG. It would also allow Ireland to be part of creating uh, indices and benchmarks, which could base, form the basis for a uh, long-term environmental uh, measure, measurement and uh, creation of financial contracts. 
So all in all, it would make it easier for investors to understand the terms of engagements with the issuers, which of course is part of uh, what we need today. So all in all, you can say that there is an opportunity arising out of this uh, for establishing such a ESG related securities platform, uh, which of course naturally could be taken up by Ireland. But there is no doubt that the short answer on this is that the focus from investors will just continue to grow, uh, not least in, in a couple of years once the EU taxonomy is fully implemented and has sunk in, so to speak. You know, and Jan, that's that's very interesting. And um, it, it really, as you say, with COVID now, it is pushing the market even more now to respond and be proactive. And there are opportunities for Ireland. And Declan, do you see that with your members, like would they be, you know, facilitative to supporting this new platform out of Ireland? Or, you know, what are the challenges and the opportunities that, you know, your members are seeing um, with ESG? And, you know, I suppose COVID is pushing this to the forefront now. It's allowing people to take a step back and look at the industry. Yeah, I think, um, look, I, I think ultimately COVID, um, unfortunately, was the catalyst to drive a reset in, in our business. And I think we all, I think all of us knew it was going to happen at some stage. And it's here right now. And uh, I think the members, I think there's also an understanding from from our members is you know there is going to be change and it's going to be change not you know not alone on the sort of the esg piece but equally on people's platforms and how they manage their platforms and where new capital is going to come from so there is there is i would just, I, I would suggest a radical change coming and, and we can see it when you look at the ownership of assets as we've seen in the past, I think that's going to change. Uh, you're not going to have these huge balance sheets, single balance sheets on, owning, you know, $30, 40000000000 billion worth of assets and some higher. I think you're going to see more flow of investments type dollars coming through our system um, on, on, onto aircraft financing. So that is going to drive change. You're going to see more in the advisory world coming through as well. So I think um the way you know i would frame it is is how do you prepare for that and equally we're seeing obviously uh, a lot of people are asking you know, investors coming in are asking a lot of questions as to how it is going you know how to invest and where, where to invest on environmental um and, and, and environmental meaningful way and i think that's fine um, and we we will adopt to that, but equally, I'd be a little bit hesitant on um, you know we had these conversations with EASA where you know do you want what you can do today to to make change you know you can basically pump up production to an enormous and the manufacturer are capable of doing this you could pump up production to a rate that you, you could drive all new technology assets the system. The problem with that is it would be a very irrational thing to do because the same people that are financing the older aircraft will be asked to finance the newer aircraft and they get wiped out overnight. So I think there has to be a sustained change. Um, EU taxonomy is probably the way to do it uh, with what's developed now. I think to see, and I think, yeah, this, uh, you know, you are seeing the UK take a, take a more of a stronger role in this. Equally, the uh, the FAA through or through you know, the US, that's beginning to take a, a more of a meaningful shape to where this is going to go. So I think, Laura, to answer your question, I think, you know, members are fully prepared to accept reality as we look out. And that reality is pivoting and changing every day. And I think where I think what we have to do, you know, you know, our, our mandate is to be based, to have this based in Ireland. So I think for us is what we need to be doing is ensuring we're offering all those services to support this inevitable change of liquidity sourcing as it comes in. We need to be able to to harness that and, and to absorb it. And equally, you know, I go back to, to, you know, why aren't we doing more? You know, we need to be developing more in the whole digitization of aircraft management. That should be based in Ireland. I think, you know, what Jan spoke about sustainable fuel, that should be based in Ireland. I think there's a lot more we should be doing 
to ensure that we, you know, when we look back at the way aviation formed and, and how it got to be such a large part of the economy, I think we really need to sort of understand that. And uh, I don't use the word, you know, I think we need to understand it and really build of it and to adopt this change because um, these changes come probably, you know, every 10, 20 years, we're sitting on the cusp of one, you know, tremendous change. And I think we need to absorb it and we just to get on with life. Sure. Yeah, no, Declan, how well said that we really are on the cusp of, you know, of something new and this new focus on it, on ESG is just a pivotal time now for the industry. And Kieran, just I, I know KPMG works across the, you know, the total aviation sector from various angles. And um, like, what do you see in particular from your clients and what are the challenges they are facing? Yeah, I, I, I think it's quite varied, right? I, uh, and ultimately, at the minute, what we're seeing is lots and lots of people um, from an aviation perspective and lots of clients ask is, you know, how do I report under ESG and what's the, what is the, what's a good standard of reporting, right? And, and there's a number of lessors out there who um, have very comprehensive ESG reporting, actually, to be fair. And I think there's, so really, at the moment, we're, we're working with a lot of clients um, on that right now reporting. What we're seeing more and more now is working with clients in relation to using ESG as a core tool in terms of risk and decision making. So if I think about you know um, enterprise risk management and ultimately managing my business by you know understanding my key risks and working to mitigate those, ESG is becoming more and more a central topic to that as you know sustainability, decarbonisation, etc. And I think we're having a, no, a number of our leasing and aviation clients are really starting to implement that as a, as a way forward. Um, and the other, I suppose, there's, there's probably two other key areas that that's starting to get a lot of attention from an aviation perspective. Um, yeah, and Declan already mentioned really is around funding. Uh, and that's clearly an area that is getting a, a lot of interest and lots and lots of people are doing that. And then the other one is, look, it, it, it's all around um, ESG and decarbonisation strategy. Where am I going? What am I doing? And how do I do it? And how do I do more? Be it myself as a business, be it the product I offer, or be it even my supply chain and my customers and, and my my suppliers. And how do we make that work together? Um, I think one thing probably maybe in support of it, of everything that Liliana is saying right is that there's no question that there is. An awful lot of our clients are asking the right questions, are doing, want to do the right thing. So I think the two things that strike me is that the consistency and the support that ALI are bringing is usually important in terms of providing that charter and that standards to drive that. I think that's a hugely important initiative, which I think will support everybody. And I think ultimately there is a lot of um, demand might not be the quite word, but we'll say demand to support the next evolution of aviation for Ireland, be it sustainable fuels, be it whatever. But you know, everything that Declan has said is correct. There's a huge opportunity for Ireland, be it digitalization, be it sustainable fuels, whatever it is. And I think it's clear from the work we're doing that there is, you know, every people out there want to be involved in that. And it's really just about providing the focal point to do that. Um, but it's a huge opportunity. Um, I think I think clients certainly what we're seeing are up for that and would like to be part of that. Yeah, no, and thank you, Kieran. That that, that is a, a very good overview of we're seeing similar thought process from our clients as well at Arthur Cox. And um Declan, just in terms of Ireland, like could the Irish government be doing more, you know, or in terms of you know what you're seeing the support they're offering? Yeah, I think, you know, we've had very good interaction and I think, um, I, I think they can. I think ultimately Ireland's position in the EU and as its position can be a major enabler in, in, um, in moving th this along. And, and it's clear the relationship and the positioning in, in, in Brussels works very well. Um, but I think, you know, from, from, from our perspective, um, we're working, I think, you know, we need to sort of, you know, to plan ahead, which we're doing, 
and you know what I, what I find is is um, once we establish going to government at the in you know immediately doesn't really work. I think we have to establish do what we say we're going to do. Um, we need to get our, our charter read with members and, and and get it published, and then we sit down with government. But but in in the meantime, there is a tremendous amount of work going on behind the scenes, and I think you know from what we have seen with the with the reorganization of the Irish Aviation Authority, I think that's very, very helpful for, for bringing us along. I think also it's positioning with where it's moving and, and listening to us. Because, if, you know, when we got the um, electronic signatures uh, agreed, that was the first time that had happened and it was done through the IEA. And, you know, we're obviously d- d- directly with, with our, our own connections through government but I, I i think the answer is sort of a long-winded answer is i i think government can do more it always can do more and just to put this in perspective jan and i presented at um the i the ISTAT conference last week in in edinburgh which is one of the major conferences for for our, our aviation group and the question was asked is who can influence it and who will direct uh, really who can influence and direct um the sustainability going forward and we put down all the usual question you know could it be you know the oems could it be the financiers you know whatever and one of them was was government 80 percent of the people responded that it was government that is going to drive this change and we, we need to respect that and we need to work with that so i think your your question laura is or to your, the answer to your question is yeah, government can do more and should do more but uh, for us we want to frame it correctly that we go for government assistance to help us bring this along at the right time when we have you know developed our own theme and, and how to uh, and so you know the right question to ask and you can then immediately establish meaningful change as you move forward no no and declan like you've hit the nail on the head and like government support is a key driver and yeah we we have to finish up now shortly but i just one question for you in terms of like how you intend to you know work with the airlines in terms of supporting this transition and whether you see it to you know leases whether you know there will be when with the move to newer technology more sustainable fuel whether you know um long leases will become a thing of the past whether you you see shorter leases you know being, or what other changes do you anticipate in terms of assisting your clients well uh that, that that's a very good question i mean clearly it's something where you're already seeing some development well i shouldn't call it developments yet but uh explorations i guess that's the way to put it because you can well imagine that uh, this entire move towards sustainability is going to make uh, or result in changes in the leases it could be the duration of the leases, it could be relating to the return conditions, it could be tied to the airlines effectively um, having an incentive to move faster towards uh, sustainability and so on. So there's a number of areas which are being explored as we speak. But I also think that it's still in that exploratory phase where it's a little bit too early to say how is this going to crystallize during the coming few years. But there's no doubt that we will see changes in the leases as a result of what we are going through right now. That would be, well, that's only natural, I guess. Okay, no, no, uh, definitely. And I think there's plenty of changes to come, a lot more government support, um, a lot of actions um, to be taken by everyone, really. I think everyone has a role to play in this industry and we all have to work together to, you know, bring about real change and for, you know, there to be, um, like, sustainable outcomes that we can all you know foster and work on so i i think we've um gotten to our cut of time um um, but it's been a pleasure catching up with you all and kieran and declan and jan and thank you so much for your time and um um hopefully speak again soon and very much looking forward to seeing you know the role you all play in the industry as we move forward to a more sustainable um environmentally friendly and um industry so th- thank you all for your time and um best of luck to you all with this new endeavor and this new world thanks thank you thank, thank you, you. Bye now. thank you Bye.